So it makes sense for us then to try to understand what it is about interaction theory, symbolic interactionism, that's different than the macro level theories that we've studied in the past. And we can understand best those differences when we talk about how we use interaction theories in research. Interaction theories essentially turn research upside down in some respects. So probably most of us are familiar with the traditional deductive ways of doing research. So for many, many decades, a couple of centuries probably, deductive reasoning has been the most popular way to do scientific research. And this type of reasoning, we start with a general type of theory, an idea or some sort of notion that we have about society. And if we think back to the work of Emil Durkheim, we can see how he would have had this sort of general observation about suicide rates increasing in his time, in his country. So his theory might have been, well, suicide rates are increasing, but I don't really understand why. And at that point, then, he has to think about how could he test his idea or his theory about suicide rates increasing. And so he comes up with a tentative hypothesis. Now, I'm sure you all remember from all of those science classes you've had over the years that a hypothesis, in a nutshell, is an if-then statement. It's a statement or relationship between two variables that can be tested. And so while we start with this really general theoretical idea, we narrow down as we start to think about how can we actually measure this theory. And we come up with our if, this, then, that statement. And an example of that, when we're still thinking about Durkheim here, an example of that would be if society has high levels of anime, social unrest, then suicide rates will increase. Now we've got something we can measure where that theory is a little cloudy to us and doesn't give us any specifics. The hypothesis gives us some specific things that we can observe. Now, we've got our hypothesis, and what we need to do at this point, then, is go out and do our research. Now, we've got to collect data and look for patterns in that data. And once we've figured out what those patterns are, we can talk about our observations. We can come to some conclusions about what those patterns mean. Now, in a deductive type of environment, when we collect our data, we collect large amounts of data that can statistically be analyzed. Now, the benefit and strength to doing that is that if we do a good random sample, then we can generalize those results back to a population. And so again, taking Durkheim as an example, if society has high levels of anime, then suicide rates will increase. Well, he could actually assert that that would be true in all populations. And that could be tested across time in all populations. So if he did a good job of collecting his data, got a good random sample, properly analyzed that data using sound statistical techniques, then he could make that generalization and that generalization would stick. We'd be able to measure that over time and come to the same types of conclusions that Durkheim did a couple of hundred years ago. So that's the traditional deductive approach to research and that's the approach that most scientists have used over the last couple of hundred years. And now recall that this traditional deductive type of reasoning works really well when we're focusing on the macro level, those big structural forces in society. Now, inductive reasoning takes a flip on deductive reasoning. And this is where interaction theories 
tend to focus on their methods of research. So inductive reasoning starts with some observations. We start looking at what's going on in society. We don't start with a theory about what we think is going to happen. Instead, we go out and look at social reality and we start maybe taking some notes about what exactly is it that we're seeing out here. We might have a vague idea or a general idea about what we want to study, but we don't go in with any sort of preconceived notions about what we're going to find. Nor do we go in with a hypothesis. We let that develop as the research unfolds. So for example, I may have some ideas about behavior in a classroom setting at a university in Florida. And I might go into a classroom and just sit there and observe and see what I figure out. Write down, take notes. It might take me a long time to do this. But once I've got all of those notes gathered up, I want to look at them all together and see if I can figure out some patterns in those observations that I made. And I probably can. If I was sitting in the back of a large lecture hall, I guarantee you I would see a lot of people texting. I guarantee you I would see a lot of people surfing the web on their computers or their tablets or their cell phones. And I might be able to say something at that point. I might be able to craft a hypothesis. I would also probably make some observations about what the faculty are doing. What is that professor doing? Are they active? Are they mumbling? Are they catching students' attention? Are the students seeming bored? Does the professor seem bored? And so I can now at this point maybe form up a hypothesis. If the professor's energy is low, then students tend to surf the web more. There's my hypothesis. And that hypothesis will lead me to a general theory. Hmm, now what could that theory be? Well, let's see. We're working at the micro level, and we want to talk about interactions in small groups or among just a few people. And so I want to think about how I could develop a theory in terms of the interaction between the professor and the student. So let's think about what this theory could be. I've made these observations in the classroom about the interactivity between the professor and the student. And I note that when the professor isn't lively and attempting to catch the student's attention, that other behaviors are occurring more frequently in the classroom. And so my interaction theory might be that there has been a breakdown in the communication between the actors in this situation. And so my theory is probably going to be something along the lines of the meaning for the student in this classroom environment has been broken. It has been violated by the professor not doing their job, not holding up their end of the interaction between the individuals involved. I could go on to test this. I could go on into a classroom where there's a lot of interactivity with that professor at the front of the classroom, and I could note what those students are doing. I could make some observations about what's going on in that classroom. I could go back and I could look for patterns in that information, and I may well come up with less students being distracted when the professor is doing a better job at lecturing. So you can see how the deductive approach, the traditional approach, and the inductive approach, the approach of interaction theorists, are very, very different. So a little more confusing than those traditional deductive research methods that we might be familiar with, but I think a very, very good approach for looking at those small group interactions. All right, I hope this helps. Take care. Bye-bye.